So good to be with you this morning. If you would turn to Luke chapter 23. We have a number of visitors. We welcome you. I walked around the parking lot before this this hour and um, we had to do some creative parking. We apologize for that and we are aware of it and we are working on it. So don't let that discourage you. Just park wherever you can and that'll be fine. We're, we're going to uh, we're working on ideas for uh, making that easier. So glad to have you with us. Last Sunday, we shared the story of the cross together. What I mean by that, for those of you who were not here, is we spent most of the time singing and telling this story, speaking to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs about the message of that day when our Savior died for us. And it was very moving to me, and I've, I've heard from several of you that were also very moved by that, as we would uh, expect. Um, there's a sorrow in the cross, and there's a, a beauty in the cross, and there's love in the cross, and there's so many things about it that, that draw out our emotional response to that. We're going to look at today a, a passage in the same chapter that I just sort of breezed over last week because I wanted to stay on track with our um, song service and with telling the story. And I, I didn't stop to kind of dwell on or think about this statement that Jesus makes that has to do with the dry wood in Luke 23. Verse 31 is where that's at. And it's really a statement in response to an emotional reaction to what was going on. So we were experiencing an emotional reaction last week to the events of the cross as we thought about that, which is only natural. And there were people who were there that day who also were experiencing a very emotional reaction to the, to the events that were transpiring. And in response to their reaction, Jesus makes a very interesting statement that, that I think we need to dig into a little bit to appreciate the meaning of it. And we'll see what it meant to those particular people he was talking to. And then the, there's a way that I think that it applies to us as well. That's what, that's what we'll look at as we look into the uh, lesson. So let's just read this account, beginning in verse, uh, chapter 23, beginning in verse 25. As they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. There followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Isn't that an interesting statement? What does he mean by this green wood and dry? And, and why does he say this to these women particularly? You know, in those days, it was very common that there were um, the women who would mourn, and in some cultures they still do this. Um, it's not so much done in our culture, but would, would weep loudly and, and would lament um, at, 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 the, at the death of someone. That was, uh, there were those, in fact, there were some who were sort of, that was their role in that whole process, was to be the grievers or the mourners. And so these ladies have come and they are following behind. Jesus is making his way toward the Calvary uh, Simon's carrying the cross and they're following along behind and they're weeping. And so he turns to them and says, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. And this statement about green wood and dry. So I think that we can um, unlock this and kind of solve this mystery of what is he saying here by looking at some previous statements. There's an image that is being built up through the book of Luke that, that leads up to this. And it starts with a statement by John. I believe these are all connected, but, um, Let's read them together and, and judge for yourself. So back in Luke chapter 3, let's go back to Luke chapter 3. This is John the Baptist, who the forerunner of Jesus. He was preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins and the fact that he was preparing the way for one to come. 
Crowds responded to him as well. In verse 7 of Luke chapter 3, he said, therefore, to the crowds that had come out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So I think we could imagine the book of Luke opening up with John's arrival on the scene to uh, prepare the way. Most of the Gospels begin with John's role as the one who prepared the way. And as John explains what was going on to these people who were coming out to hear him preach, he said, even now, there's an ax being laid to the root of the tree. So as events are starting to unfold, that we're going to have a tremendous effect on the people of Israel. And it, the time had come from the Messiah to come, but with that also came a judgment. There was a wrath that came with the salvation. And so as he was preparing the way for Jesus, he was also telling the people, there's an ax being laid right now to the root of the tree. And that's what's leading up to, I think, this green wood and dry that we'll see when we get to uh, back to Luke chapter 23. Let's next go to Luke chapter 11. Beginning in verse 49. Therefore also the wisdom of God says, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and perse persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Jesus was speaking to people, and the wrath of God was going to come on them as a consequence of all, from starting at Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain, all the way down through the history of their people, as they would reject one prophet after the next and persecute or kill them, leading up to the Son of God himself would be rejected and killed by them. And he said the wrath for all that that's been stored up is going to be poured out on this generation. So that's, that's part of that ax to the root of the trees that John the Baptist is talking about, that there's a wrath that is coming. Who warned you to flee from that wrath to come? You better repent because there's a wrath coming. And Jesus says it's going to happen to this generation. Now, let's go to next to chapter 13. Luke 13, beginning in verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came up to him and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So again, building up to this warning that Jerusalem was going to be uh, punished for their rejection of the prophets, including Jesus himself. And finally, let's go to chapter 21 as we get really, really close to where we uh, started in, in 23. But 21, he's telling his uh, disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem, beginning in verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its destruction has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are inside the sea depart. Let not those who are in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Notice verse 23. Alas, for women who are pregnant in those days, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations, 
and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the days of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, let's see if we can kind of connect some dots here and link these things together. First, we start with John the Baptist, the very beginning of the story. John goes out and he's preaching. People are responding to his message, and, and he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The ax is laid to the root of trees, even now. Then we, we, we walk through these uh, pronouncements of judgment that, that on this generation, all of the wrath that had, because of their rejection of the prophets from Abel to the present, was going to be poured out on that particular generation, that generation that was alive at that moment was going to experience that. Jesus says, your house is forsaken, and that the, all of the things that were written, this is, these are the days of vengeance to fulfill everything. It's going to happen now, and alas for those pregnant women and the people who have children. Like, it's going to be a terrible time to be alive when that day comes. So now let's go back to chapter 23. With all of that in mind, see if this statement he makes to them makes sense. So Jesus is going out to the cross, these ladies are following and they're weeping and mourning for him. But turn, he turns to them and says in verse 28 of chapter 23, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Here's what I think that he's saying. And as John is talking to us in the very beginning, there's an ax being laid to the root of the tree. And as Jesus is teaching, he's saying it's coming, and it's coming on this generation. It's going to happen to you and your children. And perhaps at the cross, you might imagine that the tree is freshly felled, but it's still wet. It's not ready quite yet to be used for firewood. And so... He's at that point, they're grieving for him because of what he's experiencing. But he says, look, th if this is what they do when the wood is green, and who is the they there? Probably the, the Romans. It was the Romans who were executing Jesus. It was He was being led out there by Roman soldiers, by a centurion, and they would be the ones who would carry out this um, execution. And he says, if they do this to me when the wood is green, what do you think they're going to do when the wood is dry? Well, what does that mean? Well, that, that wood is going to dry out. That tree that's been felled, which is represents the people, the, the Israel, you know, God's chosen people at the, up to that point, the nation who had rejected his prophets and rejected the Messiah, who, who were going to experience the wrath of God. Well, there was a time that's going to take for the wood to go from green to dry. But when it's dry, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you can kind of answer the question for yourself, right? What happens when the wood's dry? And if you think this is bad, just wait till that day. And when the, when the wood is dry, then when they, the same people who are about to nail him to a cross were going to come and absolutely destroy and demolish Jerusalem and kill thousands of people. And that would be the days when he would say they would, they would say, man, it would be better off if we didn't have little kids to take care of or worry about or to lose. And, it, you know, they would be better off if some rock would fall on them, anything, if they could hide from what the wrath that was coming. And so I think that's the point of his statement there. Specifically, he says, daughters of Jerusalem. So it was those people in Jerusalem who were going to experience this. And essentially, Jesus is saying, yes, it's sad what's happening to him, but you really ought to be sad for what's about to happen to you. Now, th thinking about that, let's think about how that applies to a little bit further on. We're going to look at some passages, which, which I think, can help us make an application beyond the cross. Obviously, we're not living in the days. You can go ahead and turn to Philippians 3. We're not, um, that destruction that came on that generation, as we understand it, happened in about 70 AD when the Romans surrounded the city of Jerusalem, exactly as Jesus said. And he had warned those who believed in him, when you see this happening, get out because it's coming. And as I understand it, they mostly did, and not very many Christians suffered in that destruction compared to the Jews who, who uh, tried to stay safe within the walls and were all wiped out. Um, but now we're like a long time past 80, 70. So what does this have to do with us? Well, there's a similar principle that's playing out on a grander scale that, that we can see and we can learn from this ourselves. So in Philippians 3, 
Writing in verse 8, Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found by him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith. That ties together with our past passage in Galatians this morning. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So what was happening to Jesus is worthy of mourning. Obviously it was sad. But it's not, if I can say this, I guess, as sad as suffering the wrath of God in an eternal sense. There's something far worse. And so Paul says, if possible, he would be glad to share in Jesus' suffering so that he could attain the resurrection of the dead. It would be better to walk with Jesus and carry a cross and be led, even if necessary, to execution. Now, yes, that would be sad, but it would be much better than avoiding that and suffering the wrath that is coming. And so Paul says once he latched onto this, he was willing to lose everything. He was willing to be led and follow Jesus. He's willing to carry his cross. He's willing to suffer with Christ and share in his sufferings, if by any means possible, if it would mean attaining the resurrection of the dead. Peter says something very similar in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. See, the path to salvation might follow Jesus' path to the cross in the sense that the path to life will lead through suffering now. And that's okay because it's going to lead to glory later. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame for the glory that was set before him. He was willing to go through that. And we should have the same attitude that we're willing to follow him and suffer now and share in his sufferings, verse 13 says, so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Let's finally go to 2 Peter 3, and we'll conclude there. Also, you might re recall that he said he called that a fiery trial that was coming upon them. And so there's like a fiery trial now, and I would say, in a sense, the wood is green, but the wood is drying out, right? And so let's connect that with 2 Peter 3, beginning verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days, with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For well, they deliberately overlooked the fact that heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, that by the means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. In other words, they're ignoring the flood when they say that. But by the same word, look at this, verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Any of you ever had to stack firewood? Most everybody's nodding. When I was a kid, we had a wood-burning stove. We had it all along the back fence, just this big, huge stack of firewood. And so you get that firewood when it's freshly cut and green, but you stack it up there, and it's stored up till when it's time to burn it, right? And if it's good and dry, it'll burn good. And that's the, the world is like a big rick of firewood. This place we live on is stored up to be burned. That's what he's saying here. Let's continue reading. Verse 8. Do not overlook this fact, 
beloved, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, a thousand days is a, is a day, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in them will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's a big fire coming, and the wood is drying out. And when the time comes, the Lord, at his, whenever he determines, and it might be a thousand years more, that's like a day to God. What's it, what's it to God to wait another thousand years? And it's not that he's being slow, it's that he's being patient. And he's given everybody ample opportunity to repent so that they don't have to experience that wrath that is to come. But when that day comes and he sets it on fire, it's going to be too late then to try to make things right. So what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? And so I think that what Jesus said to those women who were following him applied in a very specific way to that generation. Because that he was saying, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves because look at what's about to happen when the wood dries out. And I think he was talking about within their lifetime, they would see this wrath poured out on them and their children. But in the same sense, in a bigger picture, we could say the same thing today. As if you suffer as a Christian, or even as we look at the sufferings of Christ, or we look at our own suffering, it's sad. It is sad. But there's something way more sad than that. The way more sad thing is those people who don't know the Lord and those people who are going to experience the wrath that is to come. That's way more sad than whatever heartaches and hardships and difficulties we face following the Lord. So we should uh, take up our cross and follow Jesus. We should expect that that journey will involve some suffering. We shouldn't be surprised by that. If, if following Jesus leads to suffering, look at what he went through. But it's much better to suffer with Christ now, even if necessary, becoming like him in his death, if by any means we can achieve the resurrection of the dead and in so doing, avoid the wrath that is coming on the dried up wood that is this existence. So if there's someone here this morning who has something in your life that you need to make right, realize that the Lord has been patient with you to give you this opportunity. And here we are. And... If this is the day that you need to do something, and if we can help, please let us know as we stand and sing.